get started. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Joyce Raimondo. I'm the Education Coordinator at the Paula Krasna House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York. We are a national landmark, and we're about 100 miles east of New York City, and I am hosting the program today from my home, which is down the street. And our director, Helen Harrison, has graciously agreed to join us today to fill in some of the facts and the myths around Pollock, alcoholism, and art. And Helen and I will be in conversation today about this really important topic. And one of my so-called inspirations for doing this talk is to really eliminate uh, drunk driving, which of course was the, Pollock, uh, the cause of Pollock's untimely death in 1956. He was 44 years old. So we're gonna do a screen share and I have some questions for Helen and Helen and I will be in conversation together. So would you like to say hello, Helen? Hi everybody, um, I am Helen Harrison. I'm the director of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center. And I really appreciate Joyce tackling this very thorny topic, uh, one of a certain amount of speculation on Pollock's uh, motivations on his how creativity, his creativity was affected by his drinking, uh, family history. There are many, many issues to be addressed and I'm sure we won't get to all. So we're gonna explore uh, Jackson Pollock, his alcoholism, alcoholism in general, and how um, Pollock's alcoholism impacted his art. So my first question for Helen, was did Pollock's family have a history of alcoholism? And when did Pollock's alcoholism first become apparent? Helen? Yes, there was a drinking history in the family. His father and some of his brothers were also affected, but not as radically as he was. He began drinking as a teenager. And while it was a drinking culture back in those days, and it was not uncommon for young people to take a drink, Somehow it seems that he, it didn't take as much to get him really, really drunk. And many people have remarked on the fact that he would be going to a party and other people would be having a couple of drinks and they would be happy and fine and he would be roaring drunk. So it must have been something in his chemistry, perhaps, that just caused him to be super sensitive. And also drinking at an early age really got him started prematurely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Helen. And um, I do want to emphasize during the talk that alcohol addiction is a chronic illness and there are risk factors, genetics, environment, and of course, habits. And um, as I was researching this topic, I did come across the, the uh, statistic that drinking at an early age will make you much more likely to become, to have an alcohol problem. And um, that's why it is so important that the alcohol age in this country has been changed from 18 to 21. That's the period when your brain is developing. So um, once the alcohol affects a young person's brain, some of that is, is you might say, it's like a permanent uh, damage to the brain. And here is a photo of Pollock with his father, uh, who sometimes when we say, well, was the father an alcoholic or did the father drink heavy? Sometimes these terms are really in some ways not relevant. It's more, you can ask the question, did the drinking maybe affect Jackson Pollock or does someone's drinking affect you? It doesn't really matter to diagnose the person with an exact diagnosis. Now here he is at age 15. And up in the camp where his father was working as a surveyor, and he was the head of the road crew that built the uh, North Rim Road to the Grand Canyon. So it was pretty isolated. And what would the guys be doing in the evening, sitting around the campfire and drinking? So it was clearly part of a, a was a group activity at that point. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a self-portrait that Pollock did when in 1931, studying with Thomas Hart Benton in New York City. And clearly we could see in this portrait that Pollock was troubled, right? Or the self-portrait expresses almost um, 
some people, when they look at this, they say it's almost like demons haunting him. Helen, what was Pollock's state of mind at this point in his life? You know, he, when he was still in California before coming to New York, he wrote to his brother, Charles, who was in New York and who had encouraged him to come east to study with Benton. He wrote, people frighten and bore me. So he already had some problems with socialization. And I guess it might be, you might think that having a couple of drinks would loosen him up and make him feel more comfortable in, in social situations. But at this point, he was hanging out with Tom Benton and his crew, who were also heavy drinkers. And he later said that the only thing Benton taught him was how to drink a quart of whiskey a day, which is very disingenuous. Benton taught him a lot more than that. But this was, again, an encouragement of people who were in his social circle rather than people disapproving of what he was doing. And you can see that with these kind of staring eyes and hollowed out cheeks, he looks like, like he's in crisis. Mm -hmm. And when Pollock drank, did he become more social or, or how did his personality change? Well, Betty Parsons, his dealer in the 1940s and early 50s, once remarked that when he was sober, you, you couldn't get him to talk. And when he was drinking, you couldn't get him to shut up. So evidently, it did make him more sociable, but not necessarily in a positive way. Hmm. What? The PowerPoint just got stuck. Hold on. Hang on. What's going on? Oh, did I just lose the screen share? That's strange. Okay. Just got jammed for a second. Okay, so here we go. So Pollock recognizes he has a problem and he goes for treatment for alcohol addiction. And basically there are many different types of treatment for alcohol, um, but if we break it down in its simplest form, it's there's medication, there's counseling and talk therapy. And of course, there's mutual support groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous and many other types of support groups. So Helen is going to fill us in on some of the kinds of treatment that Pollock sought. My first question to Helen was, did Pollock attend Alcoholics Anonymous? Uh, according to his biographer, Jeffrey Potter, who knew him well, he did go to at least a couple of meetings, but it wasn't for him. Uh, he was not religious, so he would not let go and let God. And he also was not a talker, uh, not a sharer of his problems. So it was very difficult for him to fit into the group and to really take advantage of that kind of treatment. But he did go to the, the local physician, uh, Edwin Heller, here in East Hampton. And Heller apparently was able to keep him sober for a couple of years. And that was the only treatment that was really effective. He had tried Jungian therapy. He tried diet and uh, restrictions and special uh, salt baths. He tried um, different, uh, I guess, talk therapies, if you like, three different psychiatrists. And none of it really stuck. Hmm. Now, the serenity prayer, of course, is adopted by Alcoholics Anonymous. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Alcoholism, for example, addiction, courage the things to change the things I can, for example, seeking treatment, and the wisdom to know the difference. And what was the story behind this that was hanging in his studio um, at the time of his death? Douglas Howell was a handmade paper maker and uh, a close friend of Jackson's and he printed this especially for him in 1954 and it hung for many years on the studio wall. Yeah I think this is so poignant because it just shows this vulnerability and the tragedy of Pollock not being able to overcome this illness. So let's talk a little bit about the Jungian psychology us uh, Jungian psych psychology treatment that Pollock sought and what did it involve and how did it impact his art? It, uh, he, at first he had gone to a psychiatrist who institutionalized him for a few months, uh, but that was in uh, the mid thirties. 
But in 1939, he signed up with a guy named Joseph Henderson, who was a Jungian psychiatrist, an MD, and he tried to get him to talk. He tried the, the, the talking cure of psychiatry, but it didn't, it didn't take. Pollock was unwilling to share. So what he did was suggest that he bring his artwork to the sessions and they would discuss the imagery, excuse me, the Jungian symbolism in the artwork and that he would get to Pollock's troubles perhaps through that route rather than through the direct talking cure. So these are some of the drawings that he took with him and uh, Joseph Henderson would analyze them and explain the symbolism in Jungian terms and also the idea of collective unconscious where many of these symbols are considered to be universal across cultures and across periods of, of time. And it really made an impact on Jackson because it helped him to understand some of the underlying meanings of the symbolism. And he was very um, cognizant of Henderson's role in helping him to appreciate what he was trying to accomplish and, and how to get there. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this also reinforced Pollock's interest in indigenous people's art in some ways, such as the Navajo um, nation? You can see, yeah, you can see uh, references to Native American imagery and symbolism in his work from this period. And I think that the there's a spiritual dimension to these uh, images. And I think that that was very appealing to Pollock, although he was not religious, he certainly was interested in the spiritual side of things and used imagery like this to explore that. Now, when Pollock first starts painting, he's painting the observed world, um, working with Thomas Hart Benton. And gradually over the years, Pollock and many of the abstract expressionist artists turn within. They start painting their energy, his movement, his imagination, his unconscious mind. Did this link to his um, Jungian therapy? Yes, this I think it did. Yeah, and also, obviously there are influences from the art world that are in, in, in addition to Native American art, he was very interested in the Mexican muralists and the expressionistic forms that they created. And here in this picture, I think you can definitely see both Picasso and Miro as important influences. So he was looking at other modern artists as well as searching for indigenous forms of expression that could be either very personal or more universal. So at this point, he's synthesizing a number of different influences. Mm -hmm. Also, this idea of Jungian psychology, this appealed to many, many artists, and it was in the culture at large. Oh, yes. Pollock certainly wasn't the only one who yeah. was interested in it. Now, Pollock became sober from 1948 to 1950. So for a person who's addicted to alcohol or substance abuse, um, Abstinence is sobriety. It is 100% abstinence, free of drug or alcohol use. When we say a person is addicted, this takes on many forms, right? This could be a, a, someone who drinks every night and gets completely drunk. This could be someone who drinks twice a year and gets so drunk that they just do something crazy occasionally. Um, but and then of course, there's the idea of hitting bottom. What is the person's bottom where the person maybe, uh, you know, stole something or did something horrible and wakes up and says, I have to stop drinking. But for other people, the so-called bottom could be a higher bottom. They might recognize alcoholism in someone else and realize, wow, this is a problem. But before it becomes like really severe. So for Pollock, do you know what, how he became sober, Helen? Like, was there something like why at this time in 1948? Well, of course, uh, Lee had been concerned about this uh, for some time. Obviously, even when she met him, she knew that he had a, pro a drinking problem. But in 1948, she also had health problems and she went to the local doctor, Edwin Heller. She was complaining about colitis. 
And he said, what's causing your colitis? And she said, well, I'm worried about my husband. <laughs> He's giving me issues. And she said, uh, so Heller said to her, and this is her story. Heller said to her, well, send him to me. And she said, oh, he, he won't go, he won't come. And, and Heller said, well, he's, he's gonna hurt himself at some point, you know, he's gonna trip over something or hit his thumb with a hammer and then send him to me. And that happened, apparently he had an accident of some kind and he went to the doctor and the doctor said, your alcohol addiction is killing you and you'll have to stop. He gave him some tranquilizers and he said, you know, I'll talk to you anytime and to help you through this. And later when Pollock was asked what helped him, he said, Dr. Heller, and he was asked why. And he said, I trusted him. Mm. So it was really, it seems so simplistic that he was able to find this general practitioner, not a psychiatrist or an alcoholism specialist, but someone who just talked turkey to him and gave him the tranquilizers that he needed to be more stable and was able to keep him on track for a couple of years during which he did his most important work. You know, people think that Pollock drank in order to work, but the problem was he drank instead of working. He, mm -hmm. he said it himself, painting is not a problem. It's what to do when you're not painting. Yes, and that's one of the myths around artists and alcoholism, that alcohol somehow spurs creativity or Pollock is in the barn drunks, you know, spilling paint. And as you said, it's really the complete opposite, which we'll go to later. So I love this section. This is what I call the happy section because everything's going well for Pollock, right? Um, Pollock and Lee uh, moved to the Springs, East Hampton. They purchased the property, which is now a national landmark. Here's the barn where Pollock was painting in. Um, they marry when they move to the Springs. They have two dogs. Pollock has his pet crow. Caw -caw. And in this barn, Pollock creates his um, now famous iconic drip paintings. He was given a, a stipend from Peggy Guggenheim in 1943. So he had time to paint. And Peggy also gave them money for the down payment on the house alone. And um, Pollock has his radical breakthrough, his drip painting technique. He puts the canvas on the floor. He's working from all four sides. He's using house paint, a fluid paint to drip paint, 100% abstract art. And of course, Lee managed Pollock's career. So I think Pollock has it pretty good here. <laughs> Lee is um, negotiating on his behalf with Peggy Guggenheim. Um, and Lee, of course, did continue to do her own painting, but she didn't focus on promoting herself as a professional artist while he was alive. They agreed he would be the breadwinner. And Pollock catapults to fame. Why do you think Pollock was the one, the artist who was sort of the front runner of these abstract expressionists, Helen? Any thoughts on that? Well, because he took painting in a radically new direction. Uh, he was not applying paint to canvas in the conventional way, and he was using uh, the, the inner inspiration, the, the spontaneity, the improvisation that freed them up, freed him and other artists who were working at that time, freed them from the European conventions. The, all the breakthroughs had happened in Europe, uh, and they were trying very hard to find a new route to uh, over, overcome or surpass what had been done in Europe. And the fact that Peggy Guggenheim, who was a very sophisticated collector of modern European surrealism and abstraction, was willing to take a risk on him, he's totally unknown when she started subsidizing him, that really meant something. And when Life Magazine picked up on him, he was now showing with Betty Parsons, who was an artist herself, and she gave him the shows that you think of as the classic Pollock exhibitions from 1948 to 1951, she was able to um, engineer a market for his work that really hadn't existed before, and partly because of this kind of publicity. Uh, I mean, Life magazine had a circulation of 5 million. So this was not some little 
art magazine, this was really wide publicity and it really helped him, helped to establish him as, a, uh, as an innovator. Mm -hmm. And um, there's the myth, in addition to the crazy artist who's, who's drinking and alcoholic, there's also this myth of the starving artist. So what were Pollock and Lee's financial situation around this time? It's interesting because we have their financial records and we can actually show how much money he made every year. And each year, um, even up to 1951, he was making more or less the average wage. If you compare it to the statistics that you can get online from the um, Census Bureau. But in 1952, he had a new dealer, Sidney Janis, and Janis significantly increased his, his income, uh, tripled it, in fact. So he made over $11,000 that year, which was quite significant, considering that the average wage earner was making $3,900 a year. So from the point of view of, of economics, he actually did quite well you know, in the 1950s, but that is when his alcoholism began to overtake him. So mm. it was ironic that as soon as he really got financially well off, he was, his painting was declining. And, and this is the heartbreak of alcoholism. Um, these of course are some of the iconic uh, drip paintings that Pollock created, which are now in museums all over the world. And these were done when he was sober. Mm -hmm. And Pollock was also tremendously influential on future artists, this idea of action painting, of using your body, opening up to performance art and expression. This one is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is a mural size painting. This is the Museum of Modern Art, which has an amazing collection of Pollock paintings. Now, the tragedy of Pollock, and I think this goes for anyone with an addiction when they relapse, is sometimes everything can be going so well, right? His fame, his fortune, his relationship, his family, his marriage, his friends, right? And living in one of the most beautiful places on the planet, in my opinion. And then he relapses. So a relapse is when an alcoholic of, of of course, drinks excessively again, even though they've been sober. And sometimes it really only takes that one drink, which can set a person off, which is what happened to Pollock. And of course, there's many mental and physical effects, but I've only listed the mental effects here. Uh, poor memory, loss of concentration, um, irrational thinking patterns, depression, and inability to even do daily tasks a loss of interest, difficulty making decisions, anxiety, and sometimes an inability to sleep. So this idea that alcohol is going to uh, you know, enhance creativity, clearly we can see that if, if a person can't concentrate, for example, that is not going to enhance their artistic output. So let's see what happens to Pollock's art during this period. But before we get to that, a little bit about the story what was the moment that Pollock relapsed? Can you tell us a little bit about that, Helen? Again, according to his biographer, Jeffrey Potter, who was present, uh, there were filming, Hans Namas was filming Pollock at work outside and it had been going on for weeks and it finally got chilly out there. It was November and uh, Pollock and, and Namas were doing this paint or he was doing the painting on glass and Hans was filming him from beneath. And when they came in, they were both chilled. And Jackson went over to the liquor cabinet and took out a bottle and said, this is the first drink I've had in two years and poured himself a stiff one and one for Namath as well. And then just proceeded to get roaring drunk, disrupt the dinner party that they were having and overturn the dining table. So pretty dramatic. But that winter, he and Lee spent the winter in the city in a friend's apartment he was following up, finishing the film, doing the narration for the film and doing other things that were related to his exhibition, which would, he would typically have a show in November, December. So he was in town and he went to the Regent Clinic 
which is where his psychiatrist, Ruth Fox, had privileges. And she was an alcoholism specialist. And he was worked up by a doctor, a young doctor named Howard Zucker, whom I interviewed. And Zucker told me that he was, he didn't know he was a famous artist, but he knew he was an artist. And he went into the hospital room and Pollock was sitting up in bed and he introduced himself and he said, uh, do you have any liquor with you? And Jackson said, no. And then of course they found a bottle in the toilet tank. So they took that away and Zucker proceeded to physically examine him. And he said he, he was probing in his, in his chest area and his abdomen area and he realized that he had an enlarged liver he was only 41 mm -hmm. and he said you know you have an enlarged liver so we really need to treat you and they kept him in for a couple of weeks but it didn't take and in fact Howard Zucker gave up doing alcoholism treatment as a psychiatrist and became a child psychiatrist and I asked him why and he said, because uh, al treating alcoholism that way did not work. So for him, uh, he felt that it, it's medication was a, a more um, useful option and that the talking cure really did not, it certainly did not help Pollock, but whether or not it's valuable for others, I, I really couldn't say. Hmm. Now, I'm sure there's many different types of speculation on why Pollock relapsed. And of course, in my opinion, it's conjecture. Any thoughts on that? Well, supposedly it was because he was cold and he needed something to warm him up. That was the excuse in any event. But he did try after that. He obviously went to the Regent Clinic. He also was treated by a, a guy who was supposedly a chemist named Grant Mark, who gave him a special diet with what we would now consider pretty reasonable. Soy milk was like the basis of it. He had to drink soy milk. And then he also had to eat certain foods and avoid others. But he seemed to treat the soy milk, which was called protein, as a, uh, an antidote to the alcohol rather than a substitute for it because he continued to drink anyway. But the idea that just one drink and he fell off a cliff is not true. He did try very hard to get back on track. Uh, unfortunately, he never found a, 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 any kind of treatment that was effective. Yeah. When I said one drink off the cliff, I don't know if I said off the cliff, but I meant it, it that one drink can set someone off. Oh, certainly. I mean, yeah. that's, what, that's what put him back, uh, set him back the way it did. Yeah. So this is from our website, pkhouse.org. And Helen um, Harrison uh, explained the impact of um, alcohol as active alcoholism on Pollock's art. Can you elaborate on this a little bit, Helen? Well, in 1951, he did go back to some of the pictographic symbolic imagery that he had used in the 1940s. And as he said, as I quoted, when you're working out of your unconscious, figures are bound to emerge. So it wasn't like he was married to pure non-objective painting. The technique, as he put it, was just a means of arriving at a statement. And at this point, some of those, whatever those demons were that he was dealing with uh, in, his, in his life seemed to come out in his art. And the stark blackness, the monochromatic finish was something that did not appeal to the collectors, although the critics actually liked it and wrote favorably about it. But the, these works did not sell. And uh, so it was, it was an, an economic blow that he was not able to recover from. I think that he, you know, he lived on the sale of his work and he really did want people to buy it and people to appreciate it. So you might say we see we start to see the decline of yeah. Although yeah. I, I mean I think these are magnificent works, but they're just a, it was a, a departure. It was a return to earlier imagery, but certainly a departure from the more colorful pieces that people really admired. So mm -hmm. I think that that was a real problem for him economically. Yeah. Now, of course, also Pollock uh, becomes increasingly depressed during this period. 
he I didn't really show a lot of pictures of him from this period because it's just so heartbreaking that he really his physical appearance just he looks like a different person from when yeah. he was sober. He gained a lot of weight. He grew a beard and uh, you could see that he was physically not in good shape. He broke his bones. Apparently he had osteoporosis and there were just a lot of, of um, health problems at, during that time. Mm -hmm. And you say here his personal demons triumphed over his artistic drive mm -hmm. and then he stopped painting altogether. Um, he'd, he'd, had mood, he'd had mood swings throughout his life. I don't, he was never diagnosed properly and I don't think that he was manic depressive. I mean, his, his psychiatrist, Dr. Henderson, said that he was kind of borderline, but that it was his art that kept him on track. So as long as he was able to be creative and do his work, that really helped him. But when he started to become, um, the alcoholism overcame him, he, it really interfered with his creativity and he wasn't able to do as much work. In fact, between 1953 and, and 55, he only painted about 10 paintings. Mm. Is this paint, this is his final painting. Was this completed or was it left unfinished, do you think? No, it was signed, so it was completed, but it was originally a, a vertical composition. So the part that's now the left margin, it was the top. And he changed his mind about it and turned it on its side and made it horizontal. But the um, technique is, is very, um, it's sort of unresolved. You can see that there is pouring, there's, there's liquid paint, but then there's also paint applied with either a brush or a trowel. That's the white paint in particular is kind of clotted and, and uh, very thick, very thick impasto. Uh, there's some staining underneath. So it clearly was worked over more than once. Now he would do that with the poured paintings as well. But in this case, I think they everything got a little bit overheated. And then he, he didn't he stopped painting entirely. Mm. And he calls it search. I think that's a really interesting um, title because he clearly he was searching. And in fact, you know, having turned it from a vertical to a horizontal meant also that he was rethinking it in, in compositional terms, even after it was completed. So there was a certain quest going on that he simply wasn't able to, um, to resolve before his death. Mm -hmm. Now, tragically on August 11th, 1956, uh, Pollock dies in a crash, driving his convertible Oldsmobile under the influence of alcohol. He was 44 years old, and he took the life of Edith Metzger, who was a passenger, and Ruth Kligman, his mistress, was also in the car. She survived with, you know, serious injuries. Pollock and Krasner are buried at the Green River Cemetery right down the street from the Pollock House, Pollock Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton. And this big boulder marks Pollock's uh, grave spot. And Lee has a smaller boulder. And um, Pollock would dig up these types of boulders in his at the backyard. And um, sometimes local people even today will come along and put little rocks on his grave. Mm. Yeah, that's actually a Jewish custom where when you visit a Jewish cemetery, you would take a little prayer with you on paper and put a rock on it to hold hold it on the on the tombstone and now it's become secularized and people just bring pebbles and paint brushes and all kinds of little um, mementos that go on the graves both of them uh, and I often find even a little painting sometimes someone will take and, and leave at the grave but oh. the rocks behind the house the these things are called glacial erratics they they're left in the landscape after the last ice age and Pollock had a pile of them created behind the house. His friend with the bulldozer came and dug them up. And he had studied sculpture in high school in Los Angeles. And he told his friends he wanted to go back to doing sculpture. Now he wasn't painting anymore. And can you imagine a more physically demanding task than carving granite boulders? And he was in, in bad shape physically. So obviously he never did do it, but that was his ambition. And I think it's kind of poignant 
really sad that this was something that that he looked to as kind of a salvation and that also did did not work yeah and i think in this this next section of pollock's death we see a lot of dreams that are unrealized right that when his life was cut short and um even the museum that would have been filled with pollock sculptures was never realized is that because of his early death as well mm -hmm. Well, also the, the museum concept was, was kind of impractical at, at the time. It was really just a concept, but the idea was to have paintings and sculptures out on the lawn behind the house so that they would interact with the natural environment. Mm -hmm. So some of the circumstances behind the story of the actual accident, um, Jackson Pollock was friends with Clifford Still, and according to... Um, Kendra Keegan at the Clifford Still Museum. Um, Pollock and Clifford Still had discussed going on a road trip. They were going to take separate cars and um, Clifford Still was going to go all the way to Washington on the west coast of the US. And they were gonna meet up along the way. And this letter is from years before Pollock men mentions a road trip to Still and still was waiting in Pennsylvania for his friend. And this of course was before cell phones and even long distance calls were difficult to make. Um, and Pollock never arrived. And it was only until days later that Pollock, uh, that still realized that Pollock had died when he read the obituary. Mm -hmm. And this photo is unrelated to the interview, but um, in a later interview, still questioned, would Pollock be alive if they had gone on that road trip? And of course, it's natural to question what could have prevented the road trip. I mean, the, the tragic accident. And we'll discuss that a little more later. So here we have Pollock with his mistress, Ruth Kligman. And this was photographed by her friend, Edith Metzger, who came out to visit for a fun weekend with Pollock. Tell us a little bit about the circumstances of this affair and Lee going to Europe. Can you fill in some of the details? Well, Jackson had met Ruth. He, he would go in once a week to, to the city to visit his psychiatrist. And then after that session, he would go over to the Cedar Tavern and hang out with his friends. But evidently he met Ruth in the spring of 56 uh, at the Cedar Tavern and they started having an affair. Lee found out about it and she told him she, he needed to make a decision and he really didn't want to make a decision. He wanted them both. And he and Lee were scheduled to go to Paris and have a European vacation. Their friend Paul Jenkins had encouraged him. He said, you're more respected and revered in Europe than you are at home and you should come and take a victory lap around Paris. So Lee, they had their passports, they were ready to go, but Jackson decided to stay home and Lee decided to take the trip. And her friends told her that that was a good idea, that she needed a break, that probably by the time she got back, the affair would be over. Ruth was 26, Jackson was 44, and he was no fun. So she thought, I'll, I'll go, you know, I'll let, I'll let things settle. And then when I come back, I'll deal with it. But while she was gone, Jackson moved Ruth into the house and they started living together for a few weeks. But, and she wrote a memoir about this, which I do recommend because even though it's a little bit overblown, it's very, um, very revealing. She was very ambivalent about the relationship. And at one point she went back to the city and actually dated someone else just to have a good time. And that's when she invited her friend Ruth Metzger to come out with her for the weekend. I think she wanted company because he was, sleeping a lot, crying a lot, not working, very morose, very depressed. And she was stuck with him here, you know, isolated all alone. So anyway, whatever reason they decided to come and they got to the train station uh, in East Hampton and he picked them up and apparently was already drinking and the day kind of deteriorated from that point. They were invited to a concert in the evening at Alfonso Osorio's house and went and then didn't make it. Uh, he fell asleep at the wheel, drove back, 
and crashed on the way home. Now, this uh, memoir, which you mentioned by Ruth Kligman, really details her memory of that, that crash that she survived. This first section that I pulled up, um, apparently Jackson Pollock had pulled over and she says a police car pulled up, recognized Jackson, um, and Jackson said, nothing's wrong. We were just talking, et cetera. And then the policeman just tells them, you know, lets them on their way. So I think that this definitely points to prevention of drunk driving uh, with stricter laws and all sorts of um, not just monitoring by police, but today we also have technology that can monitor whether or not someone is drinking and driving. But of course, all of this has to be enforced. So according to the memoir, um, Edith recognizes that he's drunk. It was very visible and uh, basically begs her friend that, to get out of the car and not to go with them. And Ruth says, oh, everything is gonna be fine. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. And Edith succumbs to what you might even call peer pressure, gets into the car and this, this horrible, horrible accident occurs. They were, they went to this event or they were on their way. They stopped off at what was, can you tell us a little bit, where did they stop? Do you know the details of that, Helen, where they yeah, turned the car was, around? Supposedly it was the Cottage Inn, which was a roadhouse down on, on Fireplace Road. Uh, which was predominantly African-American. And Jackson said she wanted to go in and call a cab. And it's a Saturday night, it was busy. There were a lot of people around and Jackson said, no, you can't, unaccompanied woman, you can't go in there. And so that's why he was urging her to get back in the car and turned around and, and came home. And there was no reason for him to be speeding. He was just coming home. So this is another thing he was, you know, not rational, he was out of control. And I think that that was something that, you know, that is part of the of the issue that, that people have with alcoholism. Now I'm gonna have to move myself because our tour is coming in. So I'm going to mute myself and go. Okay, and while Helen is uh, about to come back, I, I'd like to uh, tell you about, this is the film with Ed Harris and Marsha Gay Harden, Pollock, in 2000, this scene is with Jennifer Connelly is so well acted out of the details of that day and the events surrounding this accident. It's based on the text and the director did not shy away from really being very, very graphic about what happened during the accident. And it's quite graphic about, you know, in terms of showing the horror. And I didn't show a clip because I thought it actually could trigger someone if you've ever had this sort of trauma in your life, because it is so realistic the way it's acted out. So when Pollock turned the car around and he was heading back to um, his home, he was on Springs Fireplace Road and he hit a tree and um, they flew out of the convertible, so to speak. And Pollock and Edith uh, hit a tree and um, died on the spot. And Ruth survived, as I said, with serious injuries. Uh, Lee was notified August 12th with a telephone call that her husband had died in this horrible drunk driving accident. And we'll wait and see if Helen comes back on because she'll be also okay. able to fill in. Yeah. Back. Helen, you are a treasure trove of knowledge about this, this, the details of this accident. I just went over some of the basics, but can you fill us in on some of the details of like once the accident occurred, did the police arrive on the scene? What what happened? Well, actually, we have the police report that details the injuries, that details the circumstances. And so, you know, we have a pretty clear picture of what happened. The Fireplace Road, when you, when you come up from East Hampton, there's a curve, a very kind of a long left turn, a left curve rather, on wood, uh, where Woodbine Drive is. 
Now there was no Woodbine Drive at that time. It was just a, a, a curve in the road, but the uh, right-hand shoulder, he caught his wheel in the right-hand shoulder. He didn't make the curve. He didn't turn quickly enough. And he caught his wheels in the shoulder and then he tried to correct it and shot off to the left into the woods. There were no houses there at the time. There now are houses there. And he, the car flipped over and threw him out. So he hit his head and upper body on a tree and that's what killed him. Uh, Edith Metzger was killed by the car rolling over and breaking her neck. Oh, but, I'm sorry. I, excuse me. I just said that I thought she hit a tree as well. She, oh, that's horrible. She was actually pinned under the car. Oh. And then Ruth had been thrown clear. It was a convertible. So they, you know, she, she fell out near the road and she was actually seriously injured. She had a concussion and a lot of bruises, but she, she did not break any bones, fortunately. And she didn't have any internal um, injuries uh, to her organs, but it took her quite a while to recover. But um, the, uh, when the car rolled over, it, uh, the, the horn started blaring. So a lot of people were alerted and they came around. And as you can see in the background here, there are lots of people standing on the road and, and near the car. And the police came and uh, took away, they called the ambulance obviously, took away the bodies and took uh, Ruth to the hospital in Southampton. So Pollock had hit the tree with his head and upper body. So he had head lacerations, he had a concussion, he had, um, uh, I guess his lungs were punctured. And anyway, it was fatal. He, he, there was no chance of his recovery. And the same thing for Edith. I tried to find a picture of Edith or some information about her. I wasn't able to find a picture of her. No, I have uh, never been able to find a picture of her either. And uh, it's a shame because the, the only thing I have, something I found on the internet that looks like a picture of her when she was about 13 years old, she was, her family were Holocaust survivors. They got out of Europe in time and it's such a, you know, a double tragedy here they were trapped in, in Europe and managed to escape and they come to the United States and she gets killed. Unbelievable. Now Pollock's funeral is held on August 15th at the Springs Chapel, right down the street from the Pollock house. And um, his mother attended, Stella, she was 81 years old. And um, when I read this, I just thought it was so poignant that Conrad Marco Relli, one of Pollock's um, neighbors, two doors down, right, Helen? Mm -hmm. And he arrived at the scene of the accident to identify the body. And he says, Jackson's dogs came into my house because they were looking for their master. Now, how did Lee cope with all this? Um, any, any thoughts on that following Pollock's death? How did she cope with the loss of her husband and the fallout from alcoholism itself? Well, she was devastated by his death. Uh, she had a premonition uh, when the call came in to Paul Jenkins' apartment in Paris. He said that she almost before he, as he answered the phone, that she knew there was something wrong. And when she found out that he had been killed, um, she, he was a Paul Jenkins, who was her host at the time, was afraid that she was going to throw herself out the window of the apartment. She was so distraught. They had to send her back by plane and she had to deal with the situation. She went into the city for the winter. But when she came back in the spring, she was able to move her workspace into the barn studio and began creating very, very life affirming imagery that is quite kind of amazing. The seasons. This is the masterpiece of that series, and it's in the Whitney Museum. But she did a whole series of these very colorful, very organic, and very upbeat images. And I think it's really remarkable that she was able to, even though she was still in mourning. I mean, this is only a few months after Jackson's death, but that she was able to marshal these very, very positive, life-affirming images at a time when. Uh, her private life uh, seemed to be uh, mired in tragedy. Mm. 
And you mentioned she had a premonition. This painting was left in her studio when she went on her trip and it was turned facing the wall and it was troubling her. She was, she told Pollock that, you know, she was just, this painting was troubling. It was unfinished. And Pollock told her to take that eye that's in the upper right, take that out. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when she came back, she completed the painting. But can you fill us in a little bit on this painting, Helen? Well, she said that she was having trouble with it and she had changed her approach to this much more uh, sensuous, organic, uh, kind of voluptuous forms, but there's a kind of undertone of, of um, violence in this picture. I mean, look at the head. It's got this gash on its cheek and it's, the forms are kind of bloated. It, it's got three legs or it's got almost a, a kind of explosive, like it's trying to break out of, of the canvas. And she didn't, she wasn't happy with it. She, it wasn't resolved. And she asked Jackson to come up and, and have a look at it. She was working in the upstairs studio. He went up and he said, uh, it's just keep at it. It's okay. You know, he didn't give her a lot of guidance. He, she said that, you know, they would talk about generalities rather than specifics when they discussed one another's work. But the one specific thing he did say was take out the eye. And she didn't, obviously. She left it in. So it is a kind of, I mean, it's a bloated figure with a head wound, and that is exactly what happened to Paula. Mm. That's chilling. Mm. Um, now, wait, wait. so you had mentioned to me one time that Lee felt a guilt and remorse following Pollock's death and that she was already in therapy, but then she was seeking therapy for her, this guilt that she felt. Can you elaborate on that? Well, they were both going to psychiatrists, Sullivanian psychiatrists in New York City, two, two different psychiatrists. And Dr. Leonard Siegel was Lee's psychiatrist. And we don't know whether this painting was done before Pollock's death or after Pollock's death, but it was done in 1956 with Siegel. According to Siegel's daughter, Celia, she, uh, he worked on this canvas with her. And so we don't know which part of it was done by him and which part of it was done by her, but it was done in therapy as a kind of catharsis. So it was either helping her to deal with Pollock, she, he was already having an affair and she had to cope with that, or was this a reaction to Pollock's death and its aftermath that she then had to express this whatever feelings they were occasioned in her? So that's a, that's a mystery. We won't know the answer to that one. But she was determined to persevere as an artist and also as the executor and sole heir to his estate. She had to manage his career posthumously, and she also had to manage her own career. But And she did both very shrewdly. And as a result of that, she formed the Pollock Krasna Foundation, which gives grants to artists and is still active today, which is part of her legacy as well as her art and um, ensuring that the home and studio would become a museum under the auspices of Stony Brook University. So talk about a give back. Mm -hmm. um, I think also I'd like to mention here a little bit in general about alcoholism and loving an alcoholic and losing someone through alcoholism and um, the guilt one might feel. There are many resources available, of course, to help people who are experiencing alcoholism or uh, love it. Someone who's drinking is affecting you. It doesn't matter what the diagnosis is, but it's natural for the person who is a spouse or a parent or a sibling to somehow feel that you can help that person who has a drinking problem, to feel, what could I do to help this person? Because of course, if you love someone, you don't want to see them suffer and you certainly don't want to see them decline. And all the dangerous situations that one might, you know, your loved one might be in. But there is a saying, and it goes like this, Lee did not cure it, 
I mean, Lee or anyone did not cause another person's alcoholism. You can't cure a person's alcoholism, right? You can't control another person's alcoholism. And that can be very painful to admit because it's a natural impulse to want to help someone. So I hope perhaps with Lee, that was part of her realization that she came to terms with that eventually, that really there was nothing she could have done. It didn't matter if she went on a trip, didn't go on a trip, whatever she could have done or not done. If Pollock was on that trajectory, he was heading towards destruction. Any thoughts on that, Helen? I just silenced myself because there was some traffic noise, but Yes, I think that's exactly right. Uh, we have an interview with her where she is sitting on the couch in the parlor in the Pollock house. And she said she realized it took her years of therapy to accept the fact that even if she'd been sitting right there on that couch, that the same thing would have happened eventually because that was the trajectory that he was on and that it wasn't her responsibility. But that's not, as you said, it's not something that it's easy to admit because you people always feel that they can that they can be helpful, that they can help that they can somehow intervene or interfere. And of course, in some case, intervention does work. But then the person who is in trouble has to be willing to accept it and willing to follow up and do the necessary work to become sober. And that is up to them. It's not up to you. So these are really good resources, which uh, are free. Alcoholics Anonymous is by donation. Allen on Family Groups by donation. Um, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, they have a lot of resources um, available on the website. And um, sometimes a person can also get therapy counseling for free, um, whether it's local, like here in East Hampton, we have our Family Services League. And the American Medical Association and the Center for Disease Control in the United States, it's very helpful when you read about alcoholism from the viewpoint of um, it being a medical condition. It really clarifies some of these issues. And of course, one of the best known organizations to um, combat drunk driving is Mothers Against Drunk Driving. But I really want to thank you, Joyce, for presenting this. I think this is very uh, important for people to understand how creativity is not enhanced, but is diminished by substance abuse and the tragedy that can occur for the families, for all the people surrounding the person who's in trouble. So it isn't just their own issue, you know, they, they definitely leave a lot of wreckage behind. But at least in Pollock's case, he also left some masterpieces of modern art that we can enjoy and admire in spite of the issues that, that he had to face. So I'm Absolutely. gonna say goodbye. Thank you everybody. Give Helen Harrison a Zoom round of applause, even though we can't hear it. So Helen, really, thank you so much for taking the time. I hope that this gives you an increased awareness of alcoholism. And um, if you are dealing with any issues of alcoholism, I hope that this gives you some good resources to get help and know that help is available. And just like Lee, no matter what, you can have an amazing life, no matter what what circumstances you you go through in life you can go on and have an amazing life and i hope that drunk driving is completely eradicated one day so, thank you everyone thank you George.